is our present. Yes, perfect. Uh, so we are streaming this on Facebook. Please let people know. And uh, I would like to let you know that you can ask questions on the chat along the presentations. And then we're going to have this conversatorio session when everyone is going to participate and we're going to be able to answer those questions, right? Carla? We have hey. a lot of Carlas today. So we have many Carlas. <laughs> a lot. In TESOL alone. So, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Carla Palma. I'm the Vice President of TESOL Chile. Now, uh, I'll be hosting with my colleague Carla as well. And now we are going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the people presenting today and in, in charge of this colloquium that we are so, so thankful that are participating with us. Uh, so, first of all, um, I want to talk about Carla Ojeda. She's an English teacher from Torres del Paine School District in Magallanes. She's a passionate about social emotional learning, school-wide interventions and networking in the educational community for the benefit of, the, of, of her students. Also, a, a music, sport and book lover component she, she has always tried to incorporate in her lessons. Alongside, uh, is today with us Maria Jesus in Ostrosa Araos. Uh, she's a RISOLT member and joint events coordinator of the Young Learners and Teenagers Special Interest Group, IATEFL. Currently, <clears throat> sorry, currently working as a teacher educator at Universidad de Concepción. Also, Diego Arena is with us to present. He is a TFL teacher graduated from UMSE. He is currently working as an English teacher to young learners in Liceo Eugenia Maria de Hostos, located in La Reina, Santiago. Additionally, he teaches future English teachers at Universidad Alberto Ta. And finally, but not least, is Pia Tavalli with us. And she's a teacher trainer and researcher. She's a doctor from Warwick University, and she's currently supervising practicum and teaching modules related to methodology and research at UPLA and Diego Portales University. And she was saying hello to many of her students. So it's very, very nice to, to see that students are participating with us. So we're going to leave the floor to our presenters, and I hope you enjoy and get a lot of great ideas from this presentation. And we are waiting for your questions. And thank you so much, so much for joining us. Of course. Shall we start already? Yeah? Sure. Okay. So, uh, welcome everyone again. Thank you for being here with us today. Uh, I will be the one starting. Um, this is just a reflection that we had. This is colloquium started from a discussion that we had with all the colleagues and I will talk about what we know on uh, regarding appropriate uh, pedagogies for online teachers and particularly teaching English to young learners. First, um, Carla, if we can start, great. What do we know about primary English language teachers in Chile? In 2016, we asked um, around 150 70 teachers in, that teach English in one of the, in the six or fifth uh, regions that have English from young learners the, with the large number of, of schools. And most of them said that they prepare materials uh, outside working hours, as you can see. So we know that teachers of English, particularly that work in primary and with young learners, we spend a lot of time working outside school work, right? Um, what do we know about what we do in the classes? And this is obviously Chile. Can we go to the next one, please? In 2016, uh, we collected information about what teachers teach uh, in regards to young learners in Chile. And most of them, regularly go, went into or go into uh, listening and, and telling stories, playing games, sing songs, role play. So as you could see, there is a, a variety of strategies, but this, and that will be the next one, um, this would be 
on the line or what we expect to teach young learners. So what I'm saying here is that we know very little about what happens in classrooms in Chile, particularly with young learners. But what we know is that we work many hours, first of all, um, and that we do what we are supposed to do. We are supposed to work on, and this is based on obviously on research uh, related to teaching English to young learners. But then pandemic happens, oh dear. So all this dancing and jumping and TPR and these amazing things that we do in the classroom with our kids is through the screen. So we start Googling, right? How we can get into teaching young learners. And we find this variety of elements, right? We go into resources. We have some online courses to actually get the most of my young learners. And a lot of tips, a lot of um, other people's work around the world because we, uh, we have all the experience from Europe and the States, right? That they started earlier. Um, and you know this, when I got here, and I have to say, I was looking for finding some what been going on with young learners and online teaching and published research, very little, actually none just two papers or three papers. Uh, but all these, uh, these elements were, um, was mainly about sharing experiences. And it, it seems that for us, Julian teachers, what was more mainly or most important is to collaborate. And all these sources that I shared, I showed earlier, she was that teacher collaboration and peer support is key during this process or has been key to survive the pandemic as a teacher. Um, we need to, again, bear in mind that our teachers in Chile, or we as teachers of young learners, we work a lot of hours, but we know what we have to do. And this is very important. We know what is important for our children, for our students. So um, these are examples what we had here. These are examples of um, teacher collaboration and peer support. Uh, this is, um, I will leave it in the, in, the, in the presentation later, but this is a video from a teacher. Uh, it's an example of a teacher who's been uh, preparing sessions online and she's been recording tasks for her, her students. I don't think that we are going to have time to see it now, but maybe we can leave the link uh, for the Facebook page later. Uh, these are, for example, interviews on emergency remote teaching uh, English uh, that the, we did at the state for teachers all around the world, right? And this is a summary of, of the strategies that involve uh, teaching online that came from teachers and uh, academics and is also open source. So it seems like we've been exploring a lot. And this would be the next, next one, please, Carla. And mm -hmm. we've been trying and error a lot. So um, maybe, and this is just a question, could be a great opportunity to explore the COVID practice as a teacher of English through exploratory action research. Maybe this could be, as I said, I couldn't find, and I did good research uh, on finding some publications or some information related to experiences of teachers sharing their, their, um, their practices based on um, action research or exploratory action research. And it seems there are mainly tips, but I know, we know that when we collect information about our practice, we have a lot to share with others. And we can learn a lot about our good practices and also <laughs> contribute to knowledge uh, regarding his healing. So I think that this is a great opportunity for us to start getting systematic and then share this knowledge with our peers. Um, so this, I think, that's why we, I started because uh, what we are going to talk about today is coming from what's going on in the classrooms, online classrooms. So now uh, Carla will be sharing some ideas with you.
Thank you. All right, so let's jump to teaching your learners and at the same time, how we can support them during this time while teaching English. And I think most of us have faced the same challenges, resources, connectivity, feedback, uh, engagement slash motivation. Knowing if a student will have access to a laptop or a phone with internet and then not really getting feedback, not really, and by not getting feedback, not really knowing if they are really motivated. So here I would like to show you what I like. I would like to call my transitions, the, which might be similar to some of yours, uh, between March and now. Um, as you can see, I had handouts at the very beginning where there was no interaction, no feedback at all, then the famous capsulas, but no real interaction. And now, when I have been working with online classes, and today I'm going to try to summarize in this couple of minutes what I've been doing with these online classes and what this, this, the strategies I've been using. So uh, number one, as you can see there, routines. I think that's very important for young learners and students in general, uh, providing that consistency so they know what they will be doing and at what times. Um, in my particular case, as you heard at the beginning, I'm very passionate about social emotional learning. So I try to infuse that in my classrooms or in my lessons. Um, so this SEL component is there. I try to incorporate it more and more every time I can. Um, then number three, song, games, dialogues, of course, um, because I'm reinforcing more listening and speaking rather than writing and reading. Um, and lately, I end up um, creating my virtual classroom uh, because my schedule changed, so we have to be flexible, and that's what I did. Now, I'll show you a couple of examples on each area. In the case of routines, um, you can see here, this is the first thing we do when we see or we, when we enter the class is saying hi or greeting. So my class, my classrooms are small, so each student can take the time to choose one of these greetings and say hi to their classmates. And we, because I do it too, we have to say hi the one these I uh, student chose. So the most common ones are namaste, they love namaste, and fist bump, air fist bump. So we do it together. So that in that way, we are also building classroom community. Um, the other platform that I use a lot is uh, Class Ojo. Why? Because it let me fuse that e uh, SEL component. And at the same time, I use it for attendance. I use it for behavioral uh, or classroom management. And that also helps, I don't know, you can see here helping others. All of, all of these, um, criteria uh, are for, they get, they get points, but at the same time, they are learning self-management, regulation, um, all those um, skills. Then we have this SEL component I was talking to you about. Uh, what I do in my lessons, I incorporate group dynamics. Um, so here I have three examples. Uh, this is for the little ones, for example, when we were learning about uh, parts of the house, objects in the house, we will do I spy with my little eye. So they will have to first listen what the classmate will say, because if I spy with my little eye a room, then I will have to remember, okay, my classmate or my peers at a room, so I have to remember that, and then I have to add one more object. So we do this change where we are working with the language, but at the same time, we are practicing respect, waiting for your turn, and all those elements. And this project-based learning is particular um, or corresponds to one of the schools I work at. Um, this past couple of weeks, we implemented this uh, project-based learning where I have used a lot of social emotional components because at the end, the product they will have to come up with is uh, a storytelling 
during this time, the biggest changes they have had, how they have felt. We have also incorporated the family, how the family parents have felt. You can see here, like the palms, the, uh, the palms of the hands, with the uh, feelings, the emotions they had at the beginning, and how they feel now. So you can you can also um, be mindful of that, and the students become more mindful of that too, how they feel and how their peers and family feel. And here we have also themes of the day or themes um, of the week. For for example, in my case, I have class Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays. So Mondays is Mindful Monday. So we do a mindful activity or um, wellness. Well, this Wednesday, we do a wellness activity. At least uh, once a week, we will be doing one of these three. Um, so for example, uh, last Wednesday, we did this one. We were actually working out because we were jumping and we were uh, practicing actions. Um, it was tiring. It was like 10 minutes and I was exhausted, uh, but they wanted to keep doing it. So you're flexible and it's like, okay, let's go, let's do it. Um, and then the virtual classroom. These are, this is my virtual classroom. Uh, if I press here, it will take me to my virtual classroom and with this I'm finishing. But I, I just want to show you um, that each area of the classroom has a purpose. It's not just like I am adding stuff just because. Uh, for instance, this area here is for games. So if they want to practice games or they want to, I don't know, play, this is the game area. So if I press, if they press here, it will take them to a word search and they can choose, for instance, Toy Story. And they can play. Um, this is the wellness corner, so they can here they have different, maybe I can show you later, but each corner has a purpose. Um, and, and last but not least, the resources I'm using are these ones, Google Slides, PP, PowerPoint, uh, Zoom. Um, this one, the last one, YouTube Save, I think it is very important when we share uh, videos with our students that they are filtered, like somehow we filter them. Um, and this one is uh, OBS or the screen one to send our capsulas. But pretty much that, I don't know, I think in five minutes, I tried to sum up, put everything like very quick, but I hope you get the idea. And now uh, I have Diego, Diego will be talking about um, evaluation. Okay, everyone. Hello, everyone. I was already introduced before. So for the ones who just are getting online, I work in a school in La Reina, um, teaching young learners. And today my topic is about assessing and evaluating in COVID-19 times. Okay, I know that uh, for everyone here, it has been a kind of uh, a struggle to come up with some ideas or to some strat with some strategies to evaluate our students. So in this part, in the menu of what I'm going to talk about today, I have uh, the decree 67 or decreto 67, right? Uh, just I'm going to clarify that I am not an expert in in this part in the in, in this degree. Um, I'm just uh, talking about this as a regular teacher that had to work with it, uh, has to implement it in the classrooms. Okay, I, I just wanted to clarify that part. Okay, um, obviously then I'm going to share my personal thoughts about what this decree says, and then we are going to move a little bit to the ministry recommendations that we have as well as a teacher, a normal and common teacher. So how has this affected me? And I think this has affected you as well. And what uh, have I done or thought during this um, chaotic journey we have been so, so far? Okay, next one, please. So 
according to my little student here, we have a very little summary about what the decree 67 is about. So I just rescue one part, uh, one line that I took it and translated, it, not using Google Translate, of course, <laughs> but I tried to give it the, the, the better interpretation uh, for that it is clear for everyone. So for example, it says here that the formative assessment is one of the most important elements of this decree because it contains the key purpose of this new normative. So we are here now. Uh, we were here before in the first semester in many of the schools that we are working or uh, you as colleagues are, are working at. So we were in a transition process from a kind of normal classroom environment to come and move towards the COVID times in which the uncertainty was predominant in every one of us at that moment, right? Um, so can you, sorry, can you move? <laughs> <laughs> then in the same decree, sorry about that, um, I was trying to move the slide and remember I don't have the control here. Then um, uh, according to the article two in that same uh, decree, I, I took uh, two main points that caught my attention the first time I went through it, when I started to read it and try to comprehend it and understand what was going on with that degree. So it says that according to this article, the second one, the formative assessment happens when we can integrate the teaching to monitor and accompany the student's learning process. I thought that every teacher has that for granted. We know that, right? So somebody had to put that on paper for us to, to, to realize this process. But this is what the formative assessment is about. So we have to accompany our students, especially in the, in the, in the first years at the school, because in most cases, I guess, okay, remember that I'm talking about my points of view, okay, um, and my experience, uh, most of the kids uh, do not know what a one or a seven in the scale, in the ranking scale, in the, in the evaluations mean. So they work with this, they work with, with, with congratulations, with, with ideas like, oh, well done, or oh, excellent job, but we can do this or we can do that to improve, to get it better, right? And then in the second point here that I have in blue, says that the evidence can be interpreted and used by professionals and students to make decisions about the next steps in the teaching and the learning process. So in this part, we have to involve the students, right? We have the students' voice. So it is kind of a negotiation, but it's not kind of 50-50% weights in which my negotiation is and the perspective of the student. But what can I understand by this point is that the students also have a voice, okay? The students also have to learn and they have to be part of the process, okay? So that is what I rescue from, uh, from this uh, article in this decree. So if we move on to the next slide, please, Ms. Carla. I have these questions, right? Um, the previous points, as I explained, have made me think, like, are these pandemic times providing the best scenario to apply the formative assessments, okay? For me, okay, in my case, in my opinion, I think this is not a good scenario in the living, the common living, uh, everyday living, right? But for us, uh, as teachers, I think this is one of the best scenarios we can have to start working with the formative assessments because um, as we can see in, 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 the, in the situation that may have, the different contexts that we may, have, may, we may have, not every one of the students, not all of our students can get online to, to, to learn and to, uh, and to get uh, through the next stages, okay? And then the other question that they have is, oh, no, 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 no don't move. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. The other question that I have is, can we move from the traditional assessment towards the formative one to bring down the numerical evaluation paradigm? So we were working a lot with that. So how can we move from the numerical marking to the words marking? So uh, 
that the kid is not working for a six or for a seven or for a five, but it's working for a well done, good job, excellent job. We can do it better next time. Okay, so according to what we saw about the, the decree and, and all these situations that we are having now, I have those questions still in mind. Okay, now we can move to the next one, please. Okay. <laughs> okay, and then I took some other um, phrases or from the ministry, the recommendations that they are giving us nowadays, that this is from uh, the exam resolution that happened in, in May this year, according to uh, COVID times. So, and according to the General Education Act, or um, in the Article 3, says that the educational system has to allow the equations to the learning process according to the different realities. So here we have another big question. We have a lot of different realities. So how flexible are we going to be in, during these times to promote our students to the next level or not, right? Then in the exam resolution from May, it says that um, I, uh, it is fundamental to adopt flexible criteria in the study plan and the evaluation process, considering all the dissimilar realities that we have. Okay, so they are kind of connected. So what are we going to be doing here? Okay, how are we going to consider these recommendations? In some cases, some schools have to give a qualification, a mark, sorry, a mark from one to seven to allow the students to go to the next level. I'm not here like an expert in this topic. I am here just sharing my, my opinion and my ideas regarding what we are going to do now. Okay, it's the same for everyone. It's the same for the same realities. They, do they have uh, the same conditions, studying or learning conditions to, uh, so as we can say, no, they cannot go towards the next level or they have to do the level again. So are we, um, are we not making another breach uh, between the social or economic realities that we have? Okay. Um, then in the next part, I know that uh, I have the question. So as teacher, what are we doing, right? So we tr I try to represent everyone here in different pictures. So we have, for example, the ladies, uh, Batman thinking, the lady thinking what to do. Uh, as, of, as far as I know, uh, uh, the, the female teachers are more, really much more creative than we are. Okay, uh, that is in my experience. Okay, so they can work with different uh, different uh, platforms, materials, and things. And what what is happening with our colleagues that are not that connected with with uh, technology, with technology, with communicational devices, and so. So, but I, I know that we have been doing a lot, a lot to try to get to our students, and and to 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 help. Uh, um, have a kind of a mapping of this process, right? So in the next slide, please miss, I can share with you what I have done. Uh, so I haven't invented the wheel. I haven't discovered fire. So everything has been there. So I have to learn as well. So then I'm sharing another room of my house, okay, teaching. Uh, I have, for example, I have used Google Classroom uh, for my classes for a pro platform for a repository for material and documents and one way to to follow up with the um, uh, we follow up with the idea of uh, get um, get proof that your students are working and working in the exercises in the activities that are giving them Padlet as well as um, as a wall, as a virtual wall in which students can uh, write ideas, share what we have le been learning during the class. And it's another way to monitor uh, how they are working. And it is um, very easy to follow, very easy to assess. And then you can give a comment, well done, congratulations, nice to, way to go and so on. Okay, WhatsApp has been used a lot during this time. I, I don't know, this is just me, okay? I, I haven't had, this much contact I have now with parents and students than before, okay? I don't mind giving that, but it's one way to reach and try to, to, 
to make a bridge between all those barriers that we have. Okay, of course, Gmail and phone and Zoom, for example, Zoom has a nice uh, a tool in which you can make breakout rooms and then you can have small classrooms so then you can get a more personalized uh, teaching experience for the students. Of course, YouTube, where you can have all the material and generally in which you can create, uh, create and work with capsules. So the capsules, as Carla was talking about before. Okay, this is one way to record a class, a very short video, about two to four minutes or eight minutes. So and then you can send it to your students in order that they can have access to the classes. Okay, so, and in the next slide, the next slide, sorry, I have the question here for you. What about you? I know that every, everyone has been struggling, uh, been trying to create uh, something, has thought about what about the evaluations, uh, what about uh, what they ask you to do. So I, I, I think I have explained myself. Remember that it is just my point of view, my way I see the things as a teacher, okay, not as a person who who makes the poli policies or I'm not, um, a, how can I say, challenging the, poli the policies as well, I'm just talking about it as the way I, I saw them. Uh, and that is my contribution, my five minutes. I hope I didn't use much more time. Okay, thank you. All right, so me, I'm next, yes. Right, so thank you. Uh, oh, Diego, it was lovely and very interesting to hear all of your experience, also Carla. So thank you very much for that. And now I'm the last one, so I hope that you enjoy it. You're not that tired, right? I want to dedicate my presentation to all my fellow colleagues and my students, right, at university. I want to say that I did not bribe them to come here, please. <laughs> so they're not getting any special reward or anything. <laughs> but Alicia makes them come and it's part of, of how we, it's also part of teacher training, right? To, to build this community um, of learning as uh, Hechu said at the beginning, right? So now I'm going to move a little bit from the challenge. I mean, I will, keep on talking about challenges, but I will talk about the challenges of pre-service teachers, right? Working with young learners in the context of pandemia, right? So please, next. So I will talk about the experience of my students and my fellow colleagues from UDP and uh, UPLA in Valparaíso, right? So I'm not going to dictate uh, much. I don't have much wisdom, right? But I will just share my experience, right? And I think that it happened to everyone, right? But the pandemic came as a big splash uh, from a way that I, a wave that I never saw coming, like never, 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 right? And in spite of, of this reality, and it was really hard, my pre-service pre teachers or my pre-service teacher students, right? They still needed opportunities to keep learning, right? In the field, right? But we didn't have a field anymore, right? So then just thinking about how to do practica online was crazy, right? So I'm going to talk about first about teaching uh, like pre-service teacher preparation in general regarding the Chilean context. And then I will move a little bit to talk more specifically about uh, my experience or our experience from my point of view and my students' point of view right, uh, related to practica online, right, which was weird, uh, please. Uh, some, uh, so some context, as I think that you have heard this many times, right, but there has been a global interest, right, in the teaching of English to young learners, right, we know that parents ask for these ministries of education, want this to happen, right, and they say the younger the better, and then they invest a lot of money in this, programs and everything, right? But in spite of all of that great interest and efforts, as Hechu said at the beginning, we don't really know how to teach them English in EFL context, right? Especially in Chile, 
right? So first we have no curriculum to teach young learners, right? In the first cycle of primary school, we have only proposals, right? And it's also important to consider that historically universities in Chile have been training teachers to, be, to teach in secondary school, right? And not in primary school. So plus we don't have a curriculum, so there's not really a necessity for that. In spite of that, it's happening, right? People are teaching from first to uh, from, from first to fourth grade, right? With the proposals or with independent or private projects, right? Next slide, please. Right, so if we look at some research studies and we look at um, good practices or recommended practices for teaching young learners, right? They often say that teachers or pre-service teachers or teachers uh, in service, right? They should still master both language and teaching competences, right? So in order to teach kids, you still need to be a good, good teacher, right? And, and that they also, we as teacher trainers are expected to develop this specialized professional knowledge and combine it with practice, but we don't really have that professional knowledge in Chile. So it's like, oh my God, another challenge, right? Um, next slide, please. Right, so therefore we expect a lot from our two uh, teachers, students. I don't know how to call them, it's so hard, right? But they're future teachers, right? And still, when I was trying to also inform this talk, I realized that many publications that are related to young learners don't really have a section related to how to help our pre-service teachers, right, to work with young learners. There are some good um, journals, there's one called Nothing to do with Reality by some fellow Chilean uh, researchers but still it's not related to young learners right so we still need to keep on working on that right and also because doing micro teachings is not enough right we need to incorporate them and give them more opportunities to practice and uh, next slide please right so we have some so i will call it existing challenges because i feel like after uh, we have like we, or we can say that we have this before and after life, <laughs> right? If we think about COVID, life was kind of nice and easy before and now it's completely different, right? So I will call existing challenges, right? And I was thinking about, I often ask to myself, how do we as teachers overcome the issues of the context in our practice, right? regarding that we have no, no curriculum, we don't really know how to teach young learners. Universities are just starting to include modules related to this in their mayas, right, or in their programs, right? And also how can we help pre-service teachers to learn appropriate methodologies or pedagogies to teach children, right? And so next slide, please. So I asked my students, right? How do you feel when teaching young learners in the real context when they have like chances to see them, right? So most of them were scared. They felt that they cannot control them. I don't know what to do. It was horrible. I don't know how to control classroom management. They move too much and it's hard to keep them still. Still, right? sorry, right? Sometimes you see that uh, uh, many times I find myself also doing entertaining activities, but not with not really learning objective, right? They try to be loving and caring, but they realize that it was not enough. And there are also some other experiences where they love, right, uh, children, and they felt that it was easier to engage with them in activities, right? Uh, so then the pandemia came, and so accompanyeme, a ver, this is really sad story, right? So everything make things even harder, right and all of the existing conditions and problems and challenges uh, kind of became more evident and uh, thank you thank you harder right so on top of everything that we had to do now we had to find ways to help our students to teach kids in the pandemia right when it was difficult to get schools to receive practical teachers of course 
everybody was panicking, right? Some schools decided not to teach English in the first cycle of primary school. Of course, since you don't have curriculum, right? And this is the, was the time to, to really think about what was essential. Well, English was not essential, right? So if you don't have schools teaching, then you don't have opportunities to send your students to practical. Right, that students who could work and really have an opportunity to work with teachers online <clears throat> also had to plan without knowing their students, which presented a major concern for them. Like I decided to put it in capital letters because it was it was really a strong issue, right? And the lack of interaction with the guide teachers and the students, right? It started to affect them emotionally, right? And they started to feel a little bit not motivated to keep on working. Yes, please, next slide. Right, so I asked to myself and together with my colleagues, right? And I, <laughs> we had to look at our inner self, right? Really deep, super, super deep, like breathe really, really deep and think about what we're going to do. So it has, you have to click on each of the, yes, please. So first we're like finding opportunities for our schools, for our students to go to schools, right? To have practica, right? We had to fulfill the demands of university, right? And the syllabus and also the schools. Um, please, Carla, yes. We had our, our students, um, pre-service teachers, right? That also needed this experience. We also had to understand the constraints and difficulties of each context, right? University, school, our students, our own, right? And please. And also not having any clarity and what it's like to teach online, right? So I'm a teacher training and I have to teach my students how to do it. And I don't really have no clue, right? And also this con constant question that when are we going to go back to normal, right? So pre-service teachers and the feelings, what happened in practical online? Of course, they felt lost, right? They were, and they were absolutely constrained to work with students and it was not our fault and it was not the students' fault and it was not the school's fault, right? But there were so many things that were not working and they were like in emergency or alert kind of situation that, they were constrained and they couldn't have like proper opportunities sometimes, right? Some of them, uh, remember that when we work with young learners, we depend on their parents' consent. So of course, this new person was not going to be allowed to meet uh, children online, right? We all know what other things uh, and how risky it is to use technology nowadays, especially with children, right? So they were frustrated and there was some fragmented or interaction by right? this lack of interaction as Carla said it was also important for them it will shock them right and this uh, not able to see the faces of their students really broke their hearts right and I then I realized that for them going to practica is something really really important right next slide please so and like uh, Diego that just presented. I also have questions for the audience, right? So I know that we are running out of time, but I don't know if you can help me also to, to answer, like these were the questions that were our, our students were often asking us, right? Like how can I plan for students or children that I cannot see? How am I doing? How are students liking my activities, right? Were they successful? So because opportunities for feedback was very, very hard, right? Is it only working on planning and creating activities enough for my professional development? Would they really use my material? And how can I learn to deliver and plan a whole lesson online, right? And that's a big question and this is for everyone, right? If you can help me with this one, I would really appreciate it. Next one, and I think that, uh, next one. Next, next one, I don't know what's happening. Right, so on the other side, I know that they had all these constraints, but also it was hard to receive pre-service teachers in schools, right? I know, and sometimes it was a decision of school administrators and not really the decision of teachers, right? So then another constraint. Next, please. 
And so uh, this is just some little, but this is uh, related to what uh, Hechu said, so we can skip it, right? And just go to the end of my presentation. It was a little bit long, but I hope that you enjoyed it, right? And in order to really like, what I want to tell you is that I really think that even though we are in these horrible situations, right? Our students still need practica, right? And all communities or projects that will help them to still keep on developing their skills. That's it. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry for taking so long. No worries. That was perfect. Thank you very much. Maria Jesus, Carla, Diego, and Pia for sharing your insights with us. Uh, what we're trying to do is to build community and this, the idea is to have this conversation to help each other in these uncertain and weird, hectic times. Uh, we're going to start with the questions. So Carla, if you can help me with the first question. If you have any questions, yeah. please ask, uh, ask away on the chat. If you have answers for Pia and for Diego, Please also do put them on your chat so we can start discussing. We don't have that much time, but we will do our best. Carla? Yes, I'm going to start asking the questions that uh, were written along your uh, presentations. Uh, uh, the first question is from Esteban Rodriguez. He asked, what are capsulas? Yes. But I think that people from the chat also answered. Yes, they did discuss it, but, but just in case you wanted ah, okay. to add anything, um, I'm asking I you as well. She, if... she did a capsula, so maybe Carla. Yes, yeah. it was for Carla. I mean, oh, okay. Um, capsulas are, are just short videos. Make sure they are short, no more than 20 minutes, because after that you lose the kiddos. <laughs> um, Particularly, um, the first one I did, because I didn't know better, were super long. They were like 30 minutes, um, way too long. Um, so they are just videos, short videos. I, I actually use this little guy for my young kiddos, which is from a social emotional learning program. So uh, my capsules go with this guy. But those are just short videos. Excellent, thank you. you uh, sorry, uh, Carla, do you, do you use any particular uh, program that maybe can be useful for the audience? Yes, I use one that is called, is, I'm gonna um, type it on the chat so you can see it. But it's, um, it's free when you record up to five minutes. It's really cool because you have uh, you can edit your videos and um, you can do pretty much everything there. Um, but after you pass those five minutes, you have to pay. So I mean, capsula should be no longer than that. If you want to keep your, your kids' attention, so you should be good with five minutes. Um, but the other option, if you don't want to pay, you can record yourself uh, using Zoom. Record yourself and then you uh, can use that. But I'm going to type here the name of the program I use. I use two. Uh, one is for free, the other one you pay. I hope that answered the question. I think it does. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, now I'm going to go to the next uh, question that's actually to Carla as well. Uh, it's from Marjorie Carrasco and she asked, how many students do you work with? I work with, um, uh, it's not a lot of students. I work in two schools. And in my case, I work in rural schools. So my classrooms are multi-grade, which means I have students from first grade to uh, third grade, from fourth to sixth grade, and then seventh and eighth grade. So in total, I don't have more than 20 students in one, in one entire school. Um, and then the other one is just um, the same in one classroom. Picture this, in one classroom I have, and I think uh, if I have rural colleagues here, they will know that in one classroom you can have a student from first or second grade to eighth grade. So that's my case in this year. This year I have, uh, in, in one of the schools, I have a student from second to eighth grade, all in one class. The, the advantage though with, um, 
I don't know if it has it has if um, it has happened to some of you is that because of the online classes, I can divide them now instead of having them all together in one class. So that's one big advantage. But I have just a few students. Okay, thank you. The next question is for you as well, and is regarding the virtual classroom you showed. Um, do students work individually in different areas of the virtual classroom? Is it done when you are all connected at the same time or on their own outside uh, time, outside the classroom environment? That's from uh, Daniel Wim. Okay, so actually I'm going to show you, so maybe you can see because um, I don't know if I can, if I have time to show. No, no, yeah. Uh, okay. So this is something I implemented last week and I introduced them um, to the classroom this week. Um, so it's pretty new, but like I said, each area has a purpose. Um, for example, this one is for games and each student can access um, before the classroom or after that. For example, if they are doing um, uh, recording a video, I use CISO and CISO is a tool that I use when they want to record a video and edit it, they can use that. So they can enter the classroom and click there and it will take them there. Um, this one, this area right here, I'm using it for wellness. So they can access the classroom and they can pretty much chill. For example, if I click this one, I actually love this one. It's pretty simple, but I do it myself to relax. So if I can do it, I'm sure they can do it too. Um, it's just a simulation, but they can just do this and play. And it's supposed to relax you. Sorry, Carla, to interrupt, but there is a question that says, how did you do your virtual classroom? So related to that, if you can share with, with us. Google, with Google Slides, you go with, if you, um, there are a lot of tutorials, uh, but you can do, go to um, YouTube and you'll find a bunch of them. But the point I think is that you may, when you make your own, make it your own and that reflect your style and your, and your children's, um, your children's style too. Um, and don't just add stuff just because, because it will be overwhelming. I have a lot of stuff here and it can be overwhelming, but um, as long as it has a purpose and they know that if they come here and if they go to this area, they'll find things to do, for instance, this one right here is to paint or color mandalas. So they can do that if they want to. They also have free online games, drawing, reading, learning. So it's, you can put everything on there and you can do that uh, with um, mm -hmm. Google Slides. So if you have a Gmail account, you can just uh, go to Google Drive choose Google Slides and, and start creating it. It's not uh, hard, but it takes a lot of time, um, but it's doable. You, can, you don't have to do it right away. That would be my, my advice. Don't do it, uh, don't think on doing it overnight because it will take longer than that, but it's, it's a space you can use with your, with your students. So, it will be worth it. I'm starting to use it, so it's a challenge right now that they can access and, and they can do it on their own. Um, so, so yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much, Carla. Yes, everyone is thinking because that is an excellent tip. Thank you very much. I have a question for Diego from Esteban Rodriguez. And he says, how do you go from formative assessment to, to summative assessment? That is the same question I'm asking myself nowadays. <laughs> yeah, because we were used to, at the, the, during the first semester, to work with formative assessment, right? 
uh, to try to reach all the students, uh, to try to reach everyone. So I have a class of 37 students. That is my jefatura. They, uh, I'm, I'm uh, the, the main teacher there. And only 22 connect to uh, virtual classes, yeah. sometimes 15, sometimes 16. Okay, so what is happening with the others? So, um, so uh, how can you reach the others in order to try to assess anything? Um, I remember once when I had to teach a student uh, I asked her for her computer and the street connecting her to a Gmail in order to, for her to get connected to the classroom to, and to the classes. But I cannot do that with everyone. So um, how are we going to move from formative to summative if the ministry said, okay, we need to put at least one mark. So and the school are going to say, okay, we're going to need to have evidence if the students can go or not to the next level. So that is a big question. I am going to use the same material for the ones who connect in the virtual environment to the ones who do not have any access at all to classes, even though they don't have access to uh, to to uh, capsule in, in WhatsApp, for example, or to watch YouTube, they don't have a data or just social media. So that is a very, very good question that I'm still looking for the answer to it. So is, the only thing that you have to do is to uh, adapt to the different context that you have inside the same classroom. If I have to go to that place and bring the worksheet to the student and we have to do it. So I don't want my students to fail the year and nobody wants that. It wouldn't be fair. That's Thank my you. answer. <laughs> Thank you very much, Diego. There is a comment from Danae. They said it's important that the whole learning community can support those realities. And I think that's very, very relevant. There is another question on assessment and it's from Alicia Paez and she says, why marking and what for? <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, we, there we, we were talking about say. that. Yeah, uh, I, I, I think I answered just by internal message. Yeah, yes. I, I made a mistake there. <laughs> but I say why? Yeah, why ask? This is, imp I think, uh, maybe I, I'm, I'm, I, I get fired from my the place I work for, but, <laughs> but I think that um, this is important. This is this is the moment in which we can move and we can stop putting marks just for the sake of the students. Okay, I got a five. What does that mean? I don't know, but it's a five. Okay, sometimes they don't understand. But if we manage to teach and go with the process and, and help students to learn and and demonstrate that learning without asking for a mark, okay. So that is, that is, the, this is the moment. So if we don't do it now, when we're going to do it. So later when we come back to the regular classroom, we're going to continue with the same things that we are, we were last year from March so we one to seven and so on. And they're going to uh, lose the, this, I think, great opportunity. Thank you very much, Diego. Carla has more questions. Hello. Yes, I have uh, more questions. The next question uh, says, give me a sec. Yeah. How do you manage to not overwhelm students with tasks and homework? Javier Barros asks. To whom? For Sorry? For all of you. Not, some, not somebody in particular. But how <laughs> do you do it to not overwhelm students with all this work, workload? Okay, for example, in my, in my online lessons, I don't send an extra task that is difficult to do. I, I say, for example, okay, if you can do this activity for next class, do it, and we check it next class. But I also understand that, okay, if, you're, if you are parents, for example, and you have to help your kids, and sometimes you don't know how to help them in, in, in a content that is in Spanish, for example, mathematics, language, or sciences, for example, imagine what happens to those parents who don't know do not know English, okay? How will how would they feel if they if the kids ask for help and they cannot help them, okay? So that is a situation that we should avoid, okay? We we don't help just going from class to class and then try to. For example, there is one that say, says here, for example, Manuel that says material for printing. A school sends it to the, those houses that they don't have access. 
and imagine that they can do their tasks and then you have Manuel, I, I guess that you have to go to the school and look for those uh, material and then correct the material and assess the material and then it's another cycle that then you have to give the feedback. So it's very difficult to do, right? But we as teachers have to reinvent ourselves every time and, and, and I know that this is a nice community. I see that everybody's sharing opinions and materials and we, great wishes for every one of us. So we have to continue keeping this alive. I'm sorry, Diego, but uh, here Paulina is asking, how old are your students? Okay, now I'm working with students from first grade to fifth grade, okay, in the school. So um, I'm just getting the, the idea of working with little kids because when they are in the online lessons, they are with the parents. Uh, and sometimes they know, and sometimes they can help, and sometimes they make them participate. So I try to make it fun and not overwhelming, not to know a word in English, okay? If you ask, for example, okay, how do you say car? Uh, I'm sorry, how, how do you say auto, uh, bus? Very good, very well done. Car is the word, excellent. So nobody gets mistaken in the class, right? Especially if they are kids. Excellent. Thank you, Diego. Um, this is a question uh, for Carla. What were the main challenges of the online context in rural schools? This is a question from Pedro Vera. Mm -hmm. um, I will say connectivity. Um, at the very beginning, in my case, um, my, the wrong teachers were my um, bridge between my kids and my classroom. So I didn't have the right knowledge of who has a lap had a laptop or a phone, and then that phone or laptop with uh, internet. Um, so that was the main challenge. Uh, but WhatsApp uh, helped us all, and it did. So that with that <laughs> app, I reach out. I could reach out to parents, and I was um, in direct communication with them, and it was way easier to you know who was um, able to access those resources. And obviously that also um, involves teamwork um, at the school. And still with the kids that I don't have access through online classes because there are some of them who are still in the process. Um, there are people from the school integration program who goes to their houses and they connect them. So that has been very helpful. Um, and now I will say also like two days ago, uh, we are, um, again, as a teamwork, as a community, um, trying to find the resources to reach out to those few students that still don't have internet because the point is that they all can have the access and access the, the online classes. But the main challenge was connectivity. Can I say something about uh, yes, connectivity? Sure. Um, Please. This connectivity issue affects everyone, not only rural schools. Um, based on what um, Diego said regarding how diverse our country is, we could see that children from a city like Concepcion do not have access to internet because there's only one phone at home or parents' phone and they go to work. So they cannot attend to sessions at classes, for example, and most of the teaching is done through WhatsApp. Um, so I think that this is a great opportunity, going back to my last slide, um, because teachers, uh, we are innovating enormously. I was reading all the um, things that people were sharing on how they teach and the capsulas and everything. And this experience I'm sure is shared and could be um, collected, could be analyzed. And I think that the best people to do that are the ones who are teaching, <laughs> no one else, because I understand my decisions. So all these questions that Diego presents, that the innovations that Carla is making and uh, everything that we do, we ask questions and then we try it. And if we do it on our own, obviously it would be more difficult because we don't have time. <laughs> but if we do it, we work with a colleague 
from another school, uh, maybe we can share experiences and, and collect this information together and make decisions informed based on our own decisions. So this is just, um, I think that there are great innovations happening now. Um, and it would be great that we could all uh, benefit and contribute to understand more our context because all the links that we have shared are from abroad and um, we are doing great things now so and we are using a lot of whatsapp whatsapp is not in the uk it's not in europe it's a latin american thing because that's the way we access to we communicate so i think that um i just wanted to take this minutes i'm taking talking a lot um, to uh, make a, a point there regarding everything that we are doing, that we could be sharing and we could be thinking uh, of the particularities of our context. So we can go global, as they call it. So from, from here to, from Chile to the world, basically. Thank you. I absolutely loved your term. Uh, I, I think as community, we are stronger uh, at the end of the day. Pia, there's a question for you. What advice would you give to pre-service teachers doing their professional practicum online? That goes from Mauricio Reyes. Right. Mauricio, I think that, well, that's a good question. First, I think that the, the best advice will be that it's possible, right? You are actually teaching right you're actually being a teacher right so it's not uh when we ask you to go to practica it's not that it's it's not only because we want you we want you to keep you busy right it has a learning purpose you can see i mean you have seen the story of carla and diego they have found amazing ways to communicate with their students right and then there's learning maybe it's not the same way and maybe we have to reduce our expectations, not in the terms of our, our students, but in terms of content, right? Maybe be flexible because, I mean, that's, uh, it's, it's not only for teaching, right? It's also for, for our life. Like we have to be flexible because otherwise we're gonna be crashing all the time, right? So offer your help to the teachers, right? I think they're going to appreciate it if you do it honestly and if you work hard on creating materials that will be really helpful right and i have a clear objective learning objective right so it's not only entertaining and uh, be creative right so i think that carla and diego are an excellent example and also that uh, all the comments that i have seen on the chat right people are creative you have a lot of sources and ideas right so use that trust your gut right and also find things that you think that are entertaining for you right so maybe right you can create activities that will engage everyone right and if you are bored while planning think about it right if you are if you're bored then what about your students right i think that one good advice will be to find a way to communicate with your teacher right your guide teacher at school Remember that your guide teacher at school has a lot of things to do, right? It's also crashing as you, has a family and many things, right? So it's a, it's a person. So try to adapt to the way that you can communicate, maybe WhatsApp, maybe uh, mails or whatever, right? Respect the time if teachers are giving you their WhatsApp, right? Also ask questions in advance. Don't, not, don't do things on the day before or last, like we're gonna notice, right? Teachers are quite picky and they work really hard, right? So you have to keep up to the standard. And yes, be creative and be persistent and be organized with your time because otherwise you're going to be doing things at the last time and then your teachers are going to be upset and then your students are going to be upset. So why? This is your opportunity for learning, but I think that the big, big, big advice here is that learning is happening, right? Although we are in online classes and we don't see our students, there are also opportunities, right? That, that's it. <laughs> I hope I answered the question. Yes, I think people are nodding, so that is a good sign. Thank you very much, Pia. I would like to thank 
the speakers. I would like to thank everyone. They stayed us 20 minutes after the time that we had set for this, for this conversation. Uh, there was a question on the chat that said, how do you teach preschool students? And it was answered by other teachers. And so that is what we are trying to do. That is what we want. We want to have these opportunities to share, to share our knowledge, to share our creativity, and to make a community. That's what we're trying to do. And we thank you really, really, really much about coming, being present and participating. So clap, clap for you. And we're going to have, be having more opportunities like this. So pay attention to our social uh, media, our Facebook, our Instagram. And if you want to get in top contact with us to be in an interview, to be like Diego, like Carla, like Maria Jesus, like Pia, uh, write to us to tiso, uh, chile at gmail.com. So we're giving this an end, but we're going to be having other opportunities to talk Carla. and share. Carla, more teachers, more teachers yes. to share what they're doing. We exactly. really need all yes. of us. Yes. Please, yes. Why are they doing WhatsApp? More teachers, yes. Contact more us more for via Facebook. We have received many, many, uh, many teachers sharing what they do. So please, we are looking forward to hear what you guys are doing. Any kind of, uh, even if you are any, any sort of ELT educator, we actually yes. are, are a big community. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to say that. Thank you. So excited. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So you. goodbye. Strength, like be strong. <laughs> we Keep can it up. Make, you can, we can do it. I'll we see you soon. <laughs> Let's Bye. continue to suffer, but together. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria Bye. Jesus, Bye. Carla, Pia, and Diego. Thank you so much for uh, accepting our invitation. Bye, guys. Forever grateful. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye. 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 Thank you for this class. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. There is no mark today. Thank you, guys. And bye bye to my students. Thank you for coming. Bye bye. <laughs>